Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this Adventures on the Silk Road lecture, the second in our series. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many people here tonight uh, and it's a particular pleasure to introduce Victor Mayer to give tonight's lecture. Victor, I think you'll all agree, is one of the treasures of the University of Pennsylvania. Not least because 14 years ago, he was the individual who began this story which has come as far as it has tonight and will come in the form of the exhibition early in the new year. Because in 1996, he organized here the Bronze Age and Early Iron Age peoples of Eastern and Central Asia uh, conference that was such a huge success in bringing to light the whole concept of uh, the archaeology of the Tarim Basin, these mummies, and the exhibition which we're going to show next year. Victor is Professor of Chinese Language and Literature. He's the, uh, in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. He received his PhD from Harvard in 1976, and he also holds an MPhil from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. He's been teaching at this university now for 31 years. Um, he specializes on Buddhist popular literature as well as the vernacular tradition of Chinese fiction and the performing arts. Among his chief works in these fields are Tang Huang, uh, Popular Narratives, published with Cambridge in 1983, Painting and Performance, Chinese Picture Recitation and its Indian Genesis from 1988, Tang Transformational Texts, published in 1989 with Harvard. He's the founder and editor of Sino-Platonic Papers and general editor of the ABC Chinese Dictionary series at the University of Hawaii Press. He's been a visiting fellow or professor at the University of Hong Kong, the Institute of Advanced Studies, the Institute of Research in the Humanities at Kyoto, Duke University, and the National Humanities Center in North Carolina. But throughout the 1990s, Professor Mayer organized many different research projects on the Bronze Age and Iron Age mummies of Eastern Central Asia. Among other results of his efforts during this period were three documentaries for television, that is Scientific American, NOVA and the Discovery Channel, a major international conference, which I mentioned at the beginning, which was then published, numerous articles, and I think what is deservedly the textbook on this subject, The Tarim Mummies, Ancient China and the Mystery of the Earliest Peoples from the West, which was published by Tenzin Hudson in 2000, reprinted many, many times, and you can buy it in our shop here. It's a wonderful introduction, but there's no better introduction to this subject of this exhibition than Victor Mayer himself. Please give a welcome. Well, thank you all for coming. Happy to see all of you here tonight. I'm glad that so many people are interested in mummies. Now, I don't want to disappoint you because the bodies that I'm going to talk about tonight aren't really mummies. They're desiccated corpses. I remember when I first lectured on these uh, tarim, so-called tarim mummies, it was at the Textile Museum in Washington in 1993, just after my first expedition. Let me tell you, the rug people are on top of things. <laughs> they, get to the, they get to everything first, and they bring their rugs and show off their treasured rugs. Uh, so, when I gave that lecture at the Textile Museum in uh, Washington, um, there were a few little kids in the audience, and when I said, I'm talking about desiccated corpses, a couple of them started to cry. <laughs> and people told me, uh, later. Victor, when you give your lectures later on, uh, please don't call them desiccated corpses. <laughs> call them mummies and everybody will be happy. <laughs> and everybody smiled thereafter. Uh, now, we have some real mummies in this museum. And, and I always notice when the school kids come to the University of Pennsylvania Museum, 
You can see them coming in by the droves. And the first thing they say when they enter the doors is, where are the mummies? And they go rushing off to find the mummies. So um, mummies, as we would say in Chinese or Japanese, are very kawaii, kawaii desu. Very adorable and lovable. Uh, but corpses are not. Uh, so, you know, mummy is actually, it's a, uh, it's a word derived from Arabic, and it means something like tar, like a tar baby. Uh, they're, they're treated in petroleum products and, and lots of other things, so that's what preserves them. Now, the mummies I'm going to talk about tonight aren't really mummies, and they weren't mummified. They were naturally dried out, and I will describe some other processes that made them uh, just as though somebody fell asleep in the desert and never got up. And that's what they look like. Uh, they're extremely well preserved. They look a lot better than the Egyptian mummies. I mean, they're much more approachable. <laughs> so, um, the, I did actually publish a book. Uh, uh, I did a translation of uh, a book about the mummies, uh, a book in Chinese, with a very nice book uh, called uh, by Wang Binghua, who was the former uh, director of the Institute of Archaeology in uh, Irumqi, the capital of the region where these mummies are found. And the title of the book in English, uh, he said, translate the way it really is. And I, it was the mummies of Xinjiang, uh, no, the desiccated corpses of Xinjiang in their vulture, C-V-L-T-U-R-E. It's on the cover of the book. And I can never live that down. Uh, but it's a wonderful book if you can get hold of it. Uh, it was published in China. So, I'm happy to see all of you here. And the first thing I want to say is, all of you come back sometime between February 5th and June 5th and bring 10 of your friends uh, because you're going to see uh, one of the finest exhibitions ever come to the city of Philadelphia. And it is um, it's sort of a miracle that this exhib exhibition is happening. I won't go into all the details, but it's, um, it was quite beyond my ken that it could happen. I wanted it to happen back in the middle of the 90s, but it just wouldn't work out. And I can tell you that the university, the, the university museum, the staff, which is large and energetic, they're doing a fantastic job of putting it all together. A lot of people are working very energetically. So um, I can say with no little pride that the exhibition here uh, is going to, uh, well, I, it's hard for me to say this, but it's going to be better than the other two venues. <laughs> Uh, there will be a lot more interactives and a lot more research has gone into the uh, preparation. The labels are going to be different. Uh, a lot of more explanations. So, um, if you come to this exhibition sometime after February 5th, uh, you will learn a lot. And um, because not that there's the exhibition, but there's also a self-guided tour through the rest of the museum that will uh, explain things elsewhere in the museum that are related to our exhibition. So it's, it's really a major, major thing that's happening. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. So if you uh, look at this uh, space shot of uh, Asia, Eurasia, I don't know what your eye focuses on first, but I cannot help but look at that. It's just, it, I'm inescapably drawn to that part of Eurasia. I mean, it does stand out, doesn't it? <laughs> and now, every time you look at Eurasia from space, you will also focus on that. That is the, the Tarian Basin. And situated in that basin is one of the largest, hottest, coldest, and most arid deserts in the world, the Taklamakan. And I'm not going to repeat the false etymology. Well, I'll repeat it, but I, I'm telling you, don't believe it. You go in, but you don't come out. 
that's what everybody says, but it's, it's really got a Turkish etymology that's probably means something like abandoned grape arbor. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, now if you look at that, uh, you can see that it's surrounded by the highest mountains on earth. Well, of course, there are the Himalayas. And it's all explainable by, ge by geomorphic Prophets, uh, geomorphological processes. So India came up from Africa and slammed up against the continent here about 40 or 50 million years ago. And it's still slamming up against the underbelly of Asia. And that's why the Himalayas are rising. They're still going up. If you take this part of India, you can fit it very neatly in the east coast of Africa. Uh, it took, oh, 30 or 40 million years to drift across there. So uh, actually then we have um, other mountains around here, a secondary range. Uh, the Kunlun Mountains, the Altintag, and these are the Tianshan, the Heavenly Mountains. Um, and right over here is a knot, a tangle of mountains called the Pamirs. You've probably heard of it. The Pamir Mountains, uh, that's the, uh, often referred to as the roof of heaven, uh, a roof of the earth. So we have the Tianshan Heavenly Mountains here, roof of the earth. Well, all of that is by way of saying that not much water gets in because it's all forced to be dropped before it gets up that far. And you can see that it's, that part of the, the Eurasia is very, very far from any body of water. So there's virtually no water that comes and drops down into the, in the form of rain into the Tarn Basin. However, you can see that there are these white mountains, uh, snow-clad mountains, and that is what enables people to live in these oases around the edge of the desert. Uh, because the melt, uh, the melt water from these mountains uh, gets channeled into uh, canals and that's how people survive. But because it's so formidable in terms of its e ecology, environment, uh, it's, it's also physically difficult to get there because you have to go over very high mountains and it's far from anywhere. So. Um, this is one of the last places on Earth to be populated by human beings. The only other place that may have been later are some of the uh, islands in the Pacific. It's just very difficult physically, and it's remote. Uh, so people probably st didn't start going into the Tarim Basin until about 4,000 years ago, <coughs> at least to form settlements. They, they, we have some indications of uh, trespassers or hunter-gatherers just going in but not really settling down because people couldn't do it until they learned irrigation technology that wasn't available until around 4,000 years ago. Uh, so this is where I'll be talking about all night tonight and that's where all of the objects, the artifacts in the exhibition all come from this region. And the mummies are found around here, the south and the southeast and up this far. And that, that's because of the, um, the characteristics of the soil, uh, which are very, very saline, very salty. So in a way, these mummies are like uh, human jerky. <laughs> In a way, the best mummies are jerky and freeze-dried. <laughs> freeze-dried jerky. Uh, so you know that they're not going to deteriorate. And 3,000 years, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, they're still going to look good. And we will see uh, in the exhibition a, a beautiful woman uh, called the Beauty of Shalha. Shalha means little river, and that's the uh, the site where she was discovered. I call her the Marlene Dietrich of the desert. <laughs> and she is very attractive. <laughs> <laughs>
she has these long eyelashes and flaxen hair. You, you will see in a moment that her grave in situ. So the, one of the, the biggest part of this lecture is about the site where she comes from. And that's dated to about 3,800 years ago. Um, so here we go. That's the famous Silk Road, um, which we call in the exhibition the Secrets of the Silk Road. It's not just mummies, it's about the mummies and their artifacts, plus uh, what happened after the mummies disappeared, but their, like their uh, heritage, what they gave to the region later. So the mummies uh, were about 3,800 years ago down to about uh, about a thousand years ago. The earliest mummies were all very Caucasoid, Europoid looking. So they probably came from the West somewhere. The later mummies, about, starting about 2,500 years ago, you start to get uh, traces, uh, physical traces, genetic traces from East Asia, uh, from this area, uh, slowly moving in. So by about um, 1,000, 1,300 years ago, 1,400 years ago, we have a lot of mummies too, but they're mostly, they look like East Asians. So for the first 1,500 years or so, the mummies looked mostly Europoid but increasingly with admixtures of uh, East Asians. And then for the last, say, uh, a thousand years or so, well, starting about uh, AD 4th, 5th, 6th century, they start to look very East Asian. So uh, this is the area where the beauty of Shalha is from. There's a, a site here called Lolan, some of you may have heard of the beauty of Lola, who was found earlier, uh, but she's not as pretty as the beauty of Shalwa. <laughs> she got shellacked in Shanghai as a, a kind of conservation that didn't work. So she, uh, but um, she still looks pretty, pretty amazing, the beauty of uh, Lola, but the beauty of Shalwa is from the same area, right here. The beauty of Lola was from up about there, Shalha beauty was from there, and they're both from around 1800 BC. So you can see again a more detailed map of the Silk Roads. The main thing you should note is that the uh, Silk Road splits north and south uh, and goes, goes around the desert. Of course, you can't walk through it. Another thing you'll see is that these dotted lines, those used to be rivers that went all that far. In fact, this river, went all the way up to the, this is the Tarim River, you can see. So it, they, they've dried up now, uh, and there used to be settlements all the way out here. Even over here there were settlements out in the de desert, 100, 200 or more kilometers. Uh, but by about 300 AD, uh, all those settlements were gone. Maybe during the question period you can ask me what my theory about why that happened. Give you something to ask. Um, so, now you can see the Tarian River right now, it goes down here. But it used to go over here. You can see it's dried up. In this area, this river now is called the Kumchehla, uh, or the Kutch uh, Derya in Turkey. Uh, but that's where the Tarim River used to go, and it would f it filled up this lake called the Lop Nor, uh, which is dried up too, pretty much now. And it dried that lake also dried up by about the third or fourth century. And I will explain uh, who figured all that out in, in a moment. Okay, so this is just a, another map showing you the major archaeological sites, and you can see that there are a lot of them. Um, I'll be talking about Zagunluk, uh, and there is uh, Kroren, which is Lolan, 
when I had this map made, uh, the, beauty, the Shalha site had not been rediscovered yet, so it's, there's nothing there, but it's right there. So you can see there are a lot, I'll be talking, well, maybe about Sampul and different sites along here. It depends how much time I have. This is a very important place for me, personally, Dunhuang, and I would... Anybody in the audience have been to Dunhuang? Hold up your hand. A few, yeah. It's very famous because of uh, the fact that there are fantastic uh, wall paintings there. Uh, thousands of square meters of wall paintings, beautiful. And also, there was a small cave there uh, which was filled with manuscripts. And that's what I spent the first 20 years of my career on, studying those manuscripts, the Dunhuang manuscripts. So that's a very important site. Uh, but it's not in this region, which we call Xinjiang in Chinese. I call it Eastern Central Asia to avoid political problems. Uh, Xinjiang means new territories, new borders. Um, so to neutralize that, you can see it says Uyghur region. Uh, Uyghur is, is the name, Uyghur is the name of the main ethnic group that uh, occupies that region. Uh, but there are others too, like Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tajiks, Russians. There are Russians living there. Uh, a lot of different kind of people. Uh, many different so-called minorities. And uh, the, tech, the formal name in Chinese is Xinjiang Uyghur Zijichu. The Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, so you can see many, many, many sites. And there are also sites up around here. This is the Jungarian Basin. And this, uh, these are the Altai Mountains. Uh, you've probably heard of Altaic languages. That's their homeland up here. Okay, that's Sven Hedin. I really love that picture. Smoking his cigar, his cheru. Uh, he's a Swede, and he made many expeditions to uh, this region. Um, many times almost dying from, uh, with no water and other predicaments. Uh, but he was a great cartographer. He made some of the best maps of the region that are still very reliable. Um, and he organized huge expeditions. And one of the people they took with him is this young man, Volker Bergman. I don't say it right in Swedish, Bergman. <laughs> uh, but this is, in 1934, uh, he was the archaeologist on uh, Sven Hedin's expedition. And he had heard about uh, a fabulous cemetery in the middle of the desert. From, he heard about it from an old Uyghur man named Erdek. And Erdek said that he knew he had been there, it's out in the middle of the desert, it's hard to find. Uh, but he said, and other there were also like fantastic rumors about this necropolis, this mound out in the middle of the desert that had thousands of burials. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, Erdek said he had been there back in the early part of the century, 19, uh, the 20th century, in the early part. And he went back in 1934 and wanted to find it. Because it, it, there were other rumors about this site, that it's a fabulous place, and uh, obviously an archaeologist would be interested, not just for the burial, but the, the physical shape of the mound was very special, as you'll see. So, uh, there it is. This is a 1934 photograph, uh, the photograph from uh, Bergman's uh, expedition. And his report was published in, I think in 1939 in Sweden. And after it was published, uh, nobody paid attention to it. I mean, nobody even thought about it much except a few scholars. So it was not a hot topic. They found it. Uh, they found some mummies, 
But they looked at them, they photographed a couple of them, and they respectfully reburied them. But this is a theme that uh, is very, going to be very prominent when I talk about this site, is that um, a lot of looting has gone on there. And it was not just... It, the looting goes on and on and on and on. And it was in pre-modern times too. So this is a problem, not just in China, not just in Central Asia, but all over the world. Um, looting takes place very, very soon after uh, burial, unless there's a very strong government uh, seated there on top and, and protecting things. So this site, uh, the, the theme of looting is going to be very important about how and why this site got excavated. Even when Bergman was there, it was very severely disturbed. But thank goodness, mostly on the surface and not too deep down. Uh, this is one of the bodies that uh, Folk Bergman saw and documented. And it's very important because you can see she has this felt hat. Uh, she has uh, cords on, her, on the felt hat. And we're going to see more of that later on. Uh, she has a basket there. And th these are all things that the mummies at uh, Lolan and at uh, Shalha, where she is from, but the later excavations, the same thing. They're just, there's so many mummies. Uh, equipped the same way. It was like standard burial practice. Um, and I call her, for some reason, I call her the Welsh maiden. And she looks like my mom when my mom is 25. <laughs> I'm sorry, I identify with these people. And, and uh, in a moment you'll see there's one particular man that made me become an archaeologist. Uh, uh, the director, Richard Hodges, said that I was professor of Chinese language and literature, and I was, until 1988. And then I shifted into becoming an archaeologist because of one guy, one dead guy. <laughs> so there's what it looked like when uh, Folk Bergman saw it. Now, it's tragic, but those are all coffin boards. They're just strewn all over the surface. And there were, of course, more, uh, bones, human bones, strewn all over the surface. That's what Folk Bergman saw. And these poles, uh, this is 1934, and they're a very important part of the site. Now you notice here, there's one set of pole, posts that are uh, placed very close together. And I have a theory about why they're there and what they're doing. All the archaeologists speculate on their purpose, but I think I have the right theory. Now, you can see how the, the, the sand that is blown by these fierce winds, they're called buran, and you'll see one of them in action later on. Um, they just blast, <coughs> excuse me, they blast the tops of these posts that are sticking up. In very ancient times, these all would have been decorated with um, oxen, skulls, and horns. Uh, different things would have been placed on top. And you can see how spectacular it is. They're very high poles. The whole mound is seven meters. So the mystery is, how did they build it? Where'd they get all that wood? There are a lot of mysteries. Not just one mystery. Where'd they get all the wood? Because it's just desert. Um, you can ask me questions about that too. And so, uh, these poles, you know, they go down. And now, now you'll see here, like, here's, there's a pole there, but it actually goes way down into the sand. So there are five different layers here, uh, sequentially built up. And so some of them now are almost covered up. But originally, they would have been as tall as those. So you can see how these are lower, but actually they're, they're in the sand. <coughs> Am I speaking at the right speed? Yes. Am I intelligible? Yes. Good. 
Um, okay, there's Slonan, Kronan, there's the dried up Lopnor. Oh, and it was Sven Hadid who discovered the Lopnor. Uh, he was the one who figured out how it dried up, when it dried up, why it dried up. Um, that's all his to his credit. So, uh, this is a newer map that I had made. Uh, and you, so you can see here, that's where the beauty of Lolan was from, right around here. Uh, now, the beauty of Shaohe is from Small River Cemetery, in Chinese, Shaohe Budi, or you can call it Erdex Necropolis, after the old Uyghur guy who told the Swedes where it was, more or less. They had to go wandering in the desert for quite a long time to find it. Uh, so this little rectangle is blown up over here, and there's the small river, which is mostly dried up. Certainly now, but actually when uh, Folk Bergman was there, he went down it in a boat. And a boat very like those boat coffins. Now, I, I think that the ancient people of this region actually got around but surprisingly, amazingly, a lot by boat. That Tarim River goes all the way across, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers. And though, don't forget, those rivers in the south went up uh, to the north and joined the Tarim, some of them. Uh, so th this is a very important mountain range, the Kuruk Tag, which is it's small, but that, that actually means like dry mountains. <laughs> so this area is ex extremely dry, especially dry. And uh, there were a series of cemeteries here. You can see that, that uh, the Swedes found. And Small River Cemetery is number five. Uh, the Chinese just call it Shahamudi, which means Small River Cemetery but the, it, it's actually the fifth in the whole series. There's the guy. That's, you know, I was leading a Smithsonian tour through the um, Irumchi Museum in 1988. I had been to that museum many times before, and um, I was like an old friend going back to that museum. Uh, in the early 80s, I started going. By 81, 82, 83, 84, uh, to do my research on Central Asian literature and paintings and their relationship. And so uh, I would sometimes take tours uh, to, I actually took one from the women's or, uh, group here in the museum. But that time I was taking a Smithsonian tour. And we came into a, a totally new hall, a new room that had never been there before. This is 1988. There were black curtains. I didn't know what was in there. So I pulled the curtains apart, stuck my head in, and a whole room full of mummies. And I said, come on in to my Smithsonian charges. And we all charged in. And I looked around for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I said, this is a hoax. They're fake. This is Madame Tussauds. They made them out of wax because they looked too lifelike. And their textiles were just so pristine and uh, no damage to them. And the colors were all bright and vivid. Uh, so I walked around and then I came upon this guy. And I guess my eyes were glued to him. I couldn't take my eyes off him. Uh, and I just stared at him and stared at him. Um, and then I said to my Smithsonian charges, you go home, you go to the hotel. I'm not leaving. And they, you know, they were supposed to do other things. I'm sorry, I was derelict of my duties. Uh, but I sent them back to the hotel and then I just spent the whole rest of the afternoon, probably three or four hours. And the reason I couldn't, uh, well, let me tell you first a few things about him. You see he's got these Ronald McDonald socks. He could go do advertisements for Ronald McDonald, McDonald's. And he's got a leather, deer leather uh, boot. This one is missing. Um, notice that his garment is 
very distinctive and very special. First of all, I call it burgundy, which is a theme color for everybody buried in his grave. They all were wearing this color. Secondly, notice the piping. For those of you who care about tailoring or do tailoring, that's not simple to do piping. Third, the kind of clothing he's wearing is uh, the clothing of the steps because he's wearing trousers. And only people who ride horses need, at that time needed to wear trousers. So trousers were invented to ride astride. You know, it's hard to make a crotch in a, in a pair of pants. It's a, a big effort. It's much easier just to wrap something around you. Uh, but these, so this tells us that they were coming in off the steps uh, that, it, it, to the north. So, you know, where did these people come from? I'm sure they were going back and forth across the steps to the north and they just filtered on down into this area. And uh, because uh, it's very inhospitable, and they figured out a way to live there, so it was like uh, real estate value was low. <laughs> and they managed to survive, and they had horses, which is very unusual. You wouldn't think of horses growing, uh, thriving in this area, because it's not a place with pastures and so forth. Um, okay, so there's this leather thong on his hand. And also, notice he has some kind of a a cord, a blue and red cord. That's also a theme in his family, to wear a blue and red cord. And he has a five-colored cord around his waist, which has probably some Indo-Aryan significance. Five-colored cord. Uh, but blue and red around there. And then I'm gonna, I think I'm going to show you a uh, close-up of this thong, which has everybody puzzled. Yeah, there we go. You can see his hands, how, how uh, nicely preserved they are. Okay, so we, we all had different theories about what this is. And um, I, my first speculation, well, some people said it's a whip. He whipped people with it. And my speculation was that it was a, a whip for his horse or his donkey. That was earlier, before I saw a photograph of the ex excavation. Uh, and now I'm sure that this thong well, actually is broken here. It's wrapped around his finger, very carefully made. It's broken. I'm sure that this thong uh, was used to tie him, uh, uh, to prop him up against a post in the um, at the bottom of the grave. Now why? I'll, I'll demonstrate what it was like. Okay, so he, he's in a flexed position like this. Okay, so there's a post coming up here between his legs. Or somewhere around the waist. And I'm sure that that thong was tied to the post. Now why? I'll explain it. Um, you know, when I first saw the photograph of this uh, excavation, it's on the wall in the museum, a very large photograph. And I looked at it, and I saw a lot of black-haired people, archaeologists around. And then I said to myself, my goodness, there's a blonde-haired um, there's a blonde-haired uh, archaeologist out there. That's not completely impossible in Xinjiang, because there are blonde-haired people out there today. Especially if you go to remote villages. Uh, I've seen people that just look like they could have walked out of Kansas sitting in a very small restaurant in the middle of nowhere. And I'm sure they've been there for thousands of years. But you have to go to really remote places to see them. So there was this excavation scene. I looked at it, very puzzled, and then I realized it's him. His head was being lifted up out, and it looked very white, blonde, compared to all the other archaeologists around who were bringing him up out of the grave. And then I saw other excavation photographs, and there was that post to which he was tied. Now why? Why would he be tied to the post? 
and also something would be put under him because this is part of the desiccation process to keep the bodies up off the ground if they flopped over they would deteriorate if they came in contact with the ground they would deteriorate and I'm sure that the people who buried them uh, wanted to enhance the possibility of desiccation, mummification, if you will. So that is why they, did, they took very uh, good care, not at all sites, but at, at, certainly at this site, Zagun uh, to keep the body up off the surface. Now, in his same grave, he had two wives with him. One is beautifully preserved, and she has a fantastic uh, robe on that is so well made that it's, uh, if you went to Macy's, you'd pay a lot to get it. It's just fabulous uh, robe that she's wearing, very well made, but also burgundy, just like his, but better quality than his. And so she's perfectly preserved because she stayed upright. The other woman in the, in the grave fell over and she's de disintegrated. So why? Because there's little bits of moisture in the soil. Especially, you know, it's covered up. Uh, it's, there is an empty space. These graves were not filled up with dirt. There was, uh, they were dug, and then like a, a roof would be put over, sometimes halfway down, and then also at the top. So there was empty space there. But small amounts of moisture did get in, and that would lead to uh, deterioration. Okay, there's a close-up of his face, his forehead. Uh, you can see there's a mysterious symbol painted on his temple. Uh, some people think that's a solar sign, some people think it's a mouflon uh, ram's horn because uh, Sheep and goats were very important for them. Um, and we know that it was put on him after he died because the spoon and the ochre with which it was applied, the, the, the ochre and the spoon with which it was applied was found in the grave. So this was a decoration put on after he died. This is a, uh, a chin strap to keep his mouth closed because it, during the process of drying out, uh, the mouth would gape and it would look awful. And they didn't want their deceased to look bad. So they went to the trouble of putting a chin strap on to keep the jaws together. But he, his mouth still popped open a little bit. So they put some mud or something in there to fill up the cavity. I'm sure they went back in to these graves. And we know for certain that the the graves were opened and uh, the, when somebody else died, they would put them in later. <laughs> That's my brother Dave. That's why I couldn't tear myself away from him. And I call that man War David, which means super ancient Dave. And um, actually, it was harder for me to find my brother Dave than it was for me to find Ur David. My brother sort of wanders the streets of Columbus, Ohio. Now why am I showing you this? First of all, I love Sweden. Obviously, I'm not a Swede. I have no Swedish heritage. But I like to go there and do my research sometimes at Uppsala. So these are uh, Swedish students at the end of the 19th century. And they're drinking out of right on horns. And what are they drinking? Beer. Not beer. What's it say up in the sign? It says mead. <laughs> mead. Which is mead. And everybody now knows what mead is. Uh, uh, Patrick McGovern is sitting right there. Right? Hi, Pat. Uh, Pat's the great specialist on ancient alcoholic beverages. Uh, so, uh, the re no, this, there's a reason for me putting that up there, a linguistic reason. Because this word mud is 
cognate, obviously, with mead, but it's also cognate with the word for honey in Chinese. And we know that this is a very old word in Chinese, at least 2,000, two or 300 years old, at least. And guess what? The, the word for honey in, in Mandarin is mi, but in old Chinese, it's mi. If you reconstruct the old Chinese, it's mi. So it's the same word. And who, who would have brought this word to the Chinese? 2,000, 200, or 300 years ago, or 400, I think even earlier. It was uh, most likely the Tocharians. Now, let me see a show of hands and be honest. How many of you have ever heard of the Tocharians? One, two, oh, we're making progress. <laughs> if I asked that question 15 years ago, None. Now, the Tocharians, uh, we have manuscripts in Tocharian from the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century in this region. And we even have photo, uh, pictures and uh, wall paintings at Kizil uh, of, in this region of Tocharians. We know what they looked like. They were very European looking. Reddish, blondish hair. And uh, what's very, very curious about Tocharian, it's the second oldest Indo-European language. That's one thing very curious. The first oldest, does anybody know? The old, not Sanskrit, not Avesta, Hittite. Now, if you read your Bible, you've come upon the Hittites. If you don't read your Bible, you wouldn't even have heard of the Hittites. Now, the Tocharians are the second oldest Indo-Europeans. The Hittites were the oldest. And you know, the Hittites were in Anatolia, right? And we have their archaeological sites. Chantel, well, not Chantelhuk, that's too old. Um, but we have archaeological sites for the Hittites. And they've been studied. And they have a script. And they have monumental architecture with uh, hieroglyphics. Uh, so, the Hittites are better known than the Tocharians. But I think the Tocharians are probably more important. Why? Because second weird thing about their language. Here they are. The easternmost of all the Indo-European languages. On China's back doorstep in the Han Dynasty and earlier. And their language is like Celtic, Germanic, Italic. North, Western, Western Indo-European. Not like Balto-Slavic, not like Indo-Iranian, which are Indo-European languages to the east, but like Western Indo-European languages. So, that's uh, one of the puzzling things that Mallory and I wrote about in the Tarim Mummies. We try to make it like a game, like a puzzle. And if you get into it, it's, it's quite fun to, find, to follow all the linguistics uh, of why we think those earliest mummies were probably proto-Tocharians. Okay, now I'm going to take you on a trip into the desert to this site. So, when you come to the museum, you can tell everybody, I've already been there. I heard Professor Mayer's lecture. So that's what it looks like around the edges of the desert uh, with uh, dried out poplars, some lower bushes. About the only trees that grow there are poplars, tagrak, uh, yangmil. And then you go a little further and you just have some grasses. Then you get out where there's nothing except sand dunes. Uh, and you have to go most of the way uh, by camel with the equipment. And then, this is what it looks, when you get further on, the camels sort of give up, dry out. Their humps, the, the tanks inside their humps are used up. Okay, so then you, uh, they, they just take off on foot. And this is, this man is Idris, Idris Abdursul, who is the Uyghur director of the Institute of Archaeology that led the expedition that went to excavate this site. 
The, the, I'm talking tonight about Shalpa, small river. You get it. The full Monty. That because in our exhibition, you will see uh, about one quarter of the items are from Shalpa. And this is wonderful because we can sort of um, reconfigure it in our museum. You will see a grave site. You will see a lot of artifacts from Shalpa. So this is how these objects were found by this expedition. The expedition, they actually lasted from 2002 to 2005. Now I have to tell you a little bit about the background. I'm, oh, I, I'm happy with the amount of time I have. I'll take my time. I'll take a swig of water. Please. Okay, so how did this expedition happen? Folk Bergman found the site in 1934. He published his report in 1939 in Sweden. I told you, nobody knew about it after that. Totally ignored. And then, the Chinese translation, well you see as the China became wealthier and opener, freer, more things happened. People took initiative and they got more curious about a lot of stuff. So one thing they got curious about was the ancient past. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong wasn't very fond of the past. But uh, the people in the 90s uh, started to really look at all aspects of their past. And one of the things they were interested in was uh, they knew that all those foreign archaeologists and uh, explorers had been out in Xinjiang and different parts of China. And they said, it's time for us to go rediscover these things for ourselves, uh, you know, a century later, or three quarters of a century later. So they um, started to investigate things, and they, they got Bergman's report translated into Chinese. I think that was around 1999. So then, once knowledge of Bergman's discoveries came out, the Chinese said, I want to find it. We want to re-find it. And they, uh, of course, it was out in the desert, so, but guess what? They had the advantage of GPS. And they went right to the site. Because the, the maps that the Swedes drew were so good that they could actually find it without too much trouble. Uh, but even before the archaeologists got there, the looters had got there. You know, looters are very resourceful. And they're very well equipped. I went to a a site, a Scythian site, uh, in the Ukraine, that uh, it was, it was uh, heart-rendering to me. I mean, the, the, the looters had bulldozers. They had armed guards with machine guns to keep away the real archaeologists. I mean, and then they would take the things from the Scythian graves and take them off to the Black Sea coast and then this shipped them to antiquities markets. That's how ruthless they were. Now, the looters in China are also very resourceful. Um, and so, whenever they hear of a grave anywhere, they're going to go and look at it and try to get stuff out of it. So before this expedition got there, um, the looters had gone in and done damage. So this is one of the, this is one of the reasons archaeology happens in China, because uh, okay, here's what, here's what goes on in China with archaeology. Number one reason that archaeology takes place in China is because of construction. You know, people are building hospitals, schools, roads, railroads, uh, anything in factories. And wherever you dig, you usually turn up something all over China. That's why we have this... Uh, tremendous uh, outpouring of excavation all over China. It's usually salvage, rescue. And so, in this case, it was more 
uh, uh, one of the, the looters having found out about the site, the same way the archaeologists did, but the looters getting in more quickly. So, the government, the Beijing central government authorized uh, Tram Yen, a full-scale excavation of the site to protect it from further looting. And um, so Idris had a plan, 10 years, we'll, we'll finish it, it's big, it's a big site, a lot of graves there and we want to do it right. So they, would, um, they went in in 2002, the problem is the archaeologists can only stay there for like uh, three months of the year because the conditions are so brutal. You, it gets too hot or too cold. So there are only you know, like a certain time in the spring, a certain time in the fall that you can work. Beyond that, it's just environment is too hostile. But the looters are more desperate. <laughs> and they'll go in practically any time. Uh, and they're fairly well equipped too. So what happened was uh, the um, the uh, archaeologists went in, they did their thing. First year, it was going to be like the first year out of 10 years. They pull out, and then the looters go back in. And so, um, Idris says, okay, we've got to do this in three years. And, it, and they did a magnificent job, and they actually brought in conveyor belts into the desert and removed the entire mound. When Puck took all the sand off, it's incredible. And they did a, they labeled everything, every, every single thing that they got out of the sand, and you'll see it. So they're going on in, and when it gets too hot, they crawl under these uh, stones that are actually, I mean these desert formations, those are wind eroded uh, formations called Yardam. And then off again uh, across the, uh, the barren desert. And then they come upon the site. And that's what it looks like when they, what it looked like when they rediscovered it in 2002. So you can see. Uh, but there's been some digging since then. You can see the looters were digging there. Okay, so here's a close-up of some of those posts. And here's that, I call it a palisade wall. Now you can all speculate yourselves. Uh, if you can't figure it out, you can ask me in the question period why that wall is there. Yeah, look at it carefully. Okay, so you can see something else here. that These posts have, are uh, hexagonally shaped. You see? Very nice cuts. So they, they would have had very sharp bronze uh, axes. This is from the Bronze Age. And uh, this is getting started with the excavation. You can see that these posts, which are actually really uh, probably five times that high, at the top of the mound, they're, they're, they're just showing a small amount. The rest goes way, way down into the into the sand. So here, they even labeled every single uh, fragment of the coffins on the side of the, the slope. You can see it's kind of steep. And you, you, here's a close-up of what, the, what those board, uh, coffin boards look like. Now this is something like a mausoleum that was at one end of the, the site. Uh, and when Folk Bergman visited, uh, what, 60, 70 years earlier, it was much more intact. And it was like a very high scale, upscale uh, burial place for some special people. But so it's really deteriorated now since uh, Bergman saw it. And you can see some skulls that are on the side. That's that building. So people were buried in this building. Uh, and then these are uh, statues that uh, Folk Bergman took pictures of and they, they were still there when people came back. 
And they're, they're so haunting and evocative. I, I just can't get over it. They're simple strokes, but if I were an art historian, I would have a lot to say about that. So this is Folk Bergman's um, sketch diagram of the site with the topographical lines and everything he saw on, whoops, on the surface. And then, oh, wait a minute, I have to go back. So there, there you can see the, uh, the, what I call the main palisade wall. That's north, so it's basically going east and west. <coughs> And there's a smaller one down here. Okay, I'll give you two seconds to look very carefully. Try to figure it out. Okay. And this is the, the modern archaeologist's uh, drawing of what they have found. So it's much more detailed and it's in quadrants. Okay, so they start to dig down. You can see them there in their baskets. They're digging down through the sand and these poles are starting to emerge. There's uh, one of the palisade walls. There's the archaeologist camp. And you can see very close up what those wind blasted posts look like. Uh, and now they really go at the job. They're trying to clear out all of the sand. That's Idris measuring one of the posts. And there's one of the boat coffins. <coughs> Now, uh, one thing you're going to start to see, and we will have these in our exhibition, are these, these posts that look like uh, oars, okay? Those were mysterious. Why did they put oars? Okay, obviously, I'm going to paddle around the rivers. <laughs> but it's not that. Very different. Much more exciting. Okay, so there you, uh, there were also another kind of post. When Nicholas Wade wrote about this in the New York Times, about, about four months ago, he, he conflated all the posts. But there are actually three major different kinds. And one is the, these really tall ones. And then there are the, the oar-shaped ones. And then there are these that have black and red. And they're sort of rounded at the end and very well shaped. OK? We'll talk about them. So as they removed the sand, then the posts would flop over. So they had to tie them up and position them and make them solid so that when they put the sand back, it would be in the right place. And there's what it is. Oh, I, I wanted to show you. Yeah, right there. You can see a whole series of the coffins. Uh, but these are special ones because they had six very special coffins. And they were all for women. At this place, the women ruled. Uh, they were treated much better than the men. They had double coffins. Uh, so one thing that they did uh, on the site, uh, they would slaughter oxen, cattle, right at the site. And so while their hides were still wet, uh, they would put them over the uh, coffins, and then they would dry tight as a drum, and not one single bit of sand would get in. That's how they sealed the coffins. So there, most of the, the sand has been removed. You can see uh, an oar-shaped post, and you can see a, um, a pointed post. And there's a close-up of the pointed post. Very red at the top. Black around here, black cords wrapped around in some mysterious symbolic uh, it's not an arrow, it's just a, a symbolic a, a ritual instrument wrapped around the side. Close up of the uh, oar post. And there you can see one of the uh, ox or uh, uh, cattle uh, skulls placed on top of one of the posts and it, and it still survived. And another thing you'll find that's very interesting, look at that. What is it? Leaves. Look at that. 
So like 3,800 years ago, there were a bunch of leaves around there. So this is a, a, a shot looking down at the whole site. And there's a clearer, better shot. But you can still see some of, a lot of the coffins have been exposed. And there, a very clear shot, uh, look at the palisade wall, which, you know, when we first saw it, the sand would have been up that high, right? All the, the sand is now way down. And you can see how gigantic these poles are that would have been filled up, like, you know, they would have been buried like this. Everything labeled. Now here, there's going to be the removal of the hide from the uh, one of the coffins. And you can see there's one with the hide on and there's, then the, the tops had these little planks across them after the hide was removed. You can see a close up of the hides, that one and that one. Here we are, removing the cover. Then you have to take off these planks. And look in. Oh, well, that's one for a baby. Uh, there, you see, associated with each of the burials is either one of these or one of the oars. Okay? One for one. And now looking in, first glance, you see this person has a, um, a felt cap. It's kind of dark, so you can't see it very clearly. And there's one of the uh, uh, square coffins, which is special. Very, very unusual there. Another figure. Now, you, these pins look gigantic, but actually on a human being, they would be the right size. To hold, there are pins to hold the uh, garments together. They look outsized here because he's small. This is a drawing of, uh, uh, of one of the mummies. They have a mantle. Uh, they have a felt hat, feathers on the side. Uh, they usually have a, a, a basket with wheat. It came from the west, the wheat came from the west. And wheat was very important for them. So they were agro-pastoralists, even there in the desert. Now, the tassels pointing upward, that's a female. If the tassels point down, it's a male. Um, she has a magnificent felt hat, feathers in it. Um, the felt comes in different colors. It's all natural color. So they even uh, make their mantles, their shrouds in... Uh, they use the natural color of the wool to make stripes, for example. And uh, I'll just point out a few things. I can talk for an hour about her, but I won't. One thing I want you to notice, she has a lot of a certain kind of uh, plant on her. That's ephedra. I think you all know what ephedra is for. You can get it in the drugstore. And if you want to know more about it, ask me in the question session. Okay, the other thing, I read, she has a little leather pouch to carry things in. She's got some kind of milk product all over her. Maybe like cheese or some kind of, something made of milk. She's pretty good looking, I think. And 